thank you for joining me in this beautiful spring, wintery summer. <laughs> I don't know what's the weather, but beautiful California. I'm very excited to be here, uh, not only because it's my first time to be in APSA, California, but also uh, I'm, I live in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. So they said, I, they kept saying that the winter is coming. So that's why I decided to come to California. So the topic that I'm going to present today is the result of a research that we conducted a couple of years ago uh, in a security lab at George Mason University with my colleagues and our PhD advisor. And uh, so after I presented it as Usenet Security uh, Boot Workshop, it received some media attention. But at the time, we didn't talk a lot about the details of the attack and how we conducted that. So today, I decided to give you a walkthrough to the steps that we took to conduct this research and show you how we actually achieve that uh, kind of like attacks and exploit. So in recent years, there is an increasing trend uh, in automotive in industry uh, to integrate uh, app platforms that are trusted third party applications into the IVA, IVI systems of the cars. IVI is an abbreviation of in vehicle infotainment system. And by that, I mean those head units or the radio heads that are uh, kind of like in almost all of the cars today. But there has been little public analysis of the security of these protocols and the frameworks that implement these applications into IVI systems. So therefore, we decided to answer this question that to what extent are these apps, platforms, and underlying IVI implementation are vulnerable to the attacker who can gain control of a driver's smartphone? So before getting to the details of the, the research, I'm going to give you a little bit uh, in background about myself. So I'm a PhD candidate at George Mason University. And the topic that I'm working on is related to cryptography. Basically, it is doing computation on encrypted data. And I'm actually defending my dissertation in a couple of months. So fingers crossed, wish me luck. I did my master's in artificial intelligence. And also, I'm currently doing cybersecurity and threat intelligence uh, consultation. I didn't do this. If I did, I would put it in my resume. But <laughs> <laughs> so this is the outline of the talk that I'm going to go over. First, I'm going to give you a little uh, introduction of the modern vehicle architecture and why they are vulnerable. And then I'm going to talk about the current state of the automotive security. I'm going to give you the history of all the attacks that happened so far, almost more of them that are very iconic. Then I'm going to explain our findings and the lessons that we learned during this research that are very fruitful for all of us as a people that are working in the security community. So as you all know, modern vehicles, they are not just mechanical devices anymore. They are consist of dozens small electronic components that I'm showing over there uh, that are programmed with hundreds of lines of code um, with, from different vendors. And they are run during, on different type of operating systems. And their functionalities range from engine control and braking system to driver assistant, multimedia, controlling HVAC, and very non-critical components that we have in the car. And they are all designed by car manufacturers to overcome the mechanical limitations that uh, older cars have had. So in addition to that, all of these components that I just mentioned, they are internally connected to each other. And they are talking over a common communication channel, which is called CAN bus, or controller area network. So we have several internal components that communicate via a shared network inside of the car. As I mentioned, some of them are radio, engine control unit, transmission control unit, body controller. All of them, plus some of the external uh, points of entry to this internal network, they are all connected to uh, this CAN bus that I mentioned. So all of these devices are somehow connected to this, uh, the whole infrastructure. From internal, we have some components. From external, we also open it up to, like for example, USB, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and different other external point of entry. And this picture actually nicely shows that how we are adding more features to the cars. We are opening up basically surface for the attack and the attackers. We, we are helping attackers by adding more features and not uh, caring about their security. So let's take a look at what a typical automobile looks like they are inside architecture. So this is a very high level depiction of a modern car that has essentially two buses. You can think of it as a highest speed network and a lowest speed Ethernet. 
and they need to talk to each other. Um, there are some components that act like proxies and bridges. For example, look at this body controller and telematics. It's kind of like they work as a bridge between these two uh, type of networks to make this communication possible. So the body controller, telematics, and diagnostic ports, they, con they kind of communicate on these both uh, networks. And at the bottom, there is a very important part that we call it in the auto industry OBD2 port that I'll introduce in the next slide. But what is important about that is that it is a mandated uh, device in the United States by law and that connects to all of the components inside of the car and basically it, is like, it acts like an Ethernet jack for your car. So a little bit about back, uh, CAN bus. CAN bus has a broadcast nature, meaning that each component that wants to communicate with the other component inside of the car, they have to just send their data to everyone and whoever is the recipient, they just receive to grab the information and uh, act up on that. So it is a schematic of the, like the CAN packet, how it looks like it's very similar to the network packet that I usually used to see. And the important part about this CAN and CAN bus and CAN packets is that there is no confidentiality, there is no authentication, and there is no integrity designed and implemented for the CAN bus. And it's almost very hard, if you think about it, it's very hard to implement and have e these features uh, on the CAN bus because, for example, you want to design a cryptography algorithm, for example, to uh, keep the integrity of this information on the CAN bus. It's kind of like you cannot design it because of the, uh, the critical components that have to talk to each other in the real time. So it's very challenging. The OBD port that I just mentioned, yes, this one, it is a little uh, dongle you find underneath of the steering wheel uh, on the right side dashboard. And if you plug it into, uh, if you plug into that, you have, can have access to everything. Usually garage workers, use this dongle to basically you get the diagnosed data from the network and also maybe the reprogram or flash the ECUs inside of the car. So basically when you take your car to the uh, garage workers, they just connect the OBD port, read the sensor, see what is the information, that's what is the problem. They can manipulate that flash or update the uh, firmware of these ECUs. So you can see many things can happen using access, having access to the CAN bus. And because of the features, the security features that are not there, so pretty, it's pretty vulnerable. So therefore, back in 2010, a group of researchers from UC San Diego and University of Washington, they conducted the very first comprehensive research on the, basically it was a car hacking project that de they demonstrated the ability of adversarially controlling a wide range of functionalities from disabling the brake, disabling the airbag, or maybe changing like the steering wheel and start and stop the engine and so on. But to practice responsible disclosure, they didn't uh, publish their findings in details um, about the model, about the brand, and, but they just tried to emphasize that this attack is not limited to their particular uh, manufacturer. Uh, and it could be actually applicable to many other cars and vendors and uh, different models. So after what they showed, in their paper, it's actually the paper, it's up uh, on the internet, you can just look it up and read it. It's a very interesting read, how they actually figured out about the car security. Car manufacturers, after this report came out, they kind of like panicked, shocked, because they never thought about security in terms of like attackers or hackers. They were just thinking about safety uh, things that they had to control. For example, seat belt or ABS, that was the only thing that they were thinking about as, in terms of safety and security. So after they reported this, it took a couple of years for the car manufacturers, especially the one that they attacked, to come up with a patch and they gathered security researchers to basically think about the security and develop that security mindset. After a couple of years that they patched those devices, it turns out that the car that they hacked was a Chevy Impala 2009. The key observation that they made, I'm actually having like a specific slide for that because that's very important. And that is what is used in all of the other car hacking systems, uh, researchers that you see. So an adversary with access to the internal network can control many critical and non-critical components in the car. As, as I said, they can disable or enable the brake, brakes on individual wheels. 
and to attack one ECU, it's very important, to attack one ECU, one microcomputer in one side of the uh, car, you don't need to specifically attack that ECU. You just need to be on the same network. So basically, if you can attack any other ECUs on the same network, you can easily access to the one that you're having intention to hack because the nature of this network is basically um, broadcast. Then in 2013, two security researchers, they are very famous, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, uh, they got uh, a DARPA-funded project. They did the same attack on a Toyota uh, Prius 2010 and uh, Ford Escape, and they published all the details of the attack as opposed to the previous one that we saw. And basically makes it more kind of like, uh, made more noise because it scared more uh, like a public. And also the car manufacturers were forced to think about the security issues. But what makes the research very important and interesting is that they actually they showed that this type of attacks can be generalized to many other uh, car, comp car manufacturers. And when you get inside of the car, all bets are off. So the same uh, academic yeah, group from UCSC and University of uh, Washington, they demoed a remote takeover without any physical access at an arbitrary distance over multiple attack channels. One of their interesting exploits work, uh, actually worked by re-encoding a song that if you put it on CD and play it in your computer, it would be fine, nothing, would be, nothing will happen, it will be fine. But if you put it in your car, it can take over your car. Due to a vulnerability they found inside the CD player and how it's actually, uh, the encoder read the data from the WMA files. So, Getting to another very uh, epic attack that they showed, basically they attacked and targeted the telematics unit, which is a very, very fundamental, important uh, uh, part of the, like all of the cars nowadays, because that is the, actually the way that car manufacturers, they, they would be able to from like cell, using cell on network from very distance, they can upgrade and they can basically do some stuff on your uh, cars. And also it is kind of like a, notification system when there is a crash or there is a like a somebody stole your car so they can control some functionalities from the telematics unit from the distance using the cellular network so what they showed they actually um, these telematic unix tele telematic units uh, became a pretty standard feature uh, and it was introduced first by general motors it was called on star system and was later was adapted by many other car manufacturers. So uh, how the attack worked, basically, sorry, how the telematic uh, unit works is that it's pretty interesting, especially for the Onstar, is that it is sending some signals in an analog form uh, to the down the line, and then it gets later to the digital format, but it's not a, it's not a, a point. The point is, uh, what they could do is that how the process, how the data processing control unit process the data that is coming from the center, uh, they found a vulnerability in that and they were able to encode and create a song, which then they call it uh, song of death. They take, they, they take the song, they play, I mean, the first they call the car's driver's cell phone because that's how this telematics unit uh, basically works. They call the cell phone of the driver and, sorry, not the cell phone, sorry, the car's phone number and plays a song and the car is automatically taken over because that signal is in, like if you actually, I don't know if your age is, uh, limit is like, <laughs> it's my age or not, but if you remember the previous modems that were dial up, there was like a noise that making when they were trying to connect. So the sound and this song is similar to that sound because it's using the modem system to send this information to the line. So. That was pretty cool and interesting, and if you want, you can, it is an epic picture that they have up. So you, there are some, they have some uh, interesting YouTube videos you can watch later and enjoy it. So in another attempt that I'm just trying to summarize here is that they tried to upgrade the firmware of the radio with a malicious firmware image. And this picture is pretty important because that's how we did at attack, like the schematic of the network at how we misuse it and some other researchers, how they did the attack. 
So basically, any of these components that are in any side of this um, network, especially the lowest speed ones, they are non-critical components, basically. For example, the infotainment system is not considered a very uh, critical component in the car, as opposed to brake system. But if the attacker sends something malicious from the infotainment systems, it sits on, for example, sent for the telematics unique. That's how the upgrade works for the radio. They can bridge to the network that goes to the critical components of the car. And basically, that's how they relay this uh, malicious packet and malicious um, message to the critical components of the car and take over. So they conducted this research in the lab. They showed it. And also, they did it uh, in a real world. Like uh, They have like, some also YouTube videos you can watch. So in 2015, again, Charlie Miller and Chris Velasek, they did a similar attack on Jeep Cherokee, but they leveraged the vulnerabilities in the telematics unit in Fiat machines that was called the Uconnect. And again, they are showing that this issue is a general issue. It's not uh, actually uh, specialized for car manufacturers. And because of what they did, they tried to practice uh, the disclosure, public disclosure um, steps. and. After that, Fiat uh, was forced, kind of like not forced, but they had to recall almost 1.4 million cars as a result of the attack that they showed and they publicly showed it. So again, uh, Charlie Miller and Kelis Varasek in uh, another research in 2016, they tried to see if those patches, the car that was patched by Fiat, still they, they are vulnerable or not. And they showed another in another research that there are still some vulnerabilities in those and need to be fixed. So <clears throat> later at DEF CON 2015, Sami that we have him here, like for a keynote, did an interesting attack and designed a small wireless device costing only $100 that should, have, that should be attached to the car to gain access to the car by leveraging vulnerability in an OnStar smartphone application. And later showing that this attack is not only limited to GM cars, but also BMW and Benz are having the same issue with their smartphone applications. In another research that uh, UCSD and this uh, researcher from university showed, um, cars can also be hacked by getting access to those insurance dongles that basically you buy from like very uh, famous insurance companies. And they at you attach it to the car basically to use this service that you pay as you go. But apparently, turns out that those devices also, they have some vulnerabilities. And they, in their research, they show that if you can basically exploit those vulnerabilities, you can take, uh, take over the car. Because that system is attached to, many, to, to the CAN bus and many other critical components. In like other follow-up researches that I'm not going to do uh, because of the time, with respect to the time, I cannot go over the details of them. But they are pretty interesting as well. Some researchers that did. Um, research on the Tesla machines, like X and S and X models. They presented in different conferences. Subaru Starlink was similar to the head unit uh, exploit. And also uh, the recent work that was presented in DEF CON 2019, they showed the vulnerabilities in BMWs. So other types of indirect access attacks that I'm going to, I didn't show them in the, uh, like the timeline, but they are still possible. and. Some people, they don't consider them car hacking, but they are somehow related. Or that, for example, if somebody hacks the Bluetooth in the hands-free kit, and they try to like, listen and uh, eavesdropped on the conversations of the passengers in the car, or maybe just using this uh, wireless unlocking system, or playing with the tire pressure monitoring system that just annoyingly just turn on the light and the tire pressure and say, OK, you have to change the, you have to um, work on the tire pressure. And also, it is so one of the attacks that Sammy did, but it's not his picture, that he hacked a <laughs> passive keyless entry <laughs> and uh, start uh, system. Basically, just he followed this. Like, if you follow these instructions, that how he did it, it's basically jammed the t attempts that the driver is making to open the car, but then try to use it when the second time attack uh, driver is trying to open the car and hijack that conversation and send his own first message and show that it's possible from 40 meters almost away from the car. So how we are standing, this, the research that I'm going to talk about, basically, it is 
conducted in 2016 uh, by the collaboration from our university and then our advisor, like Dr. Damon McCoy, he was initially one of the researchers on the USCS when he was doing his postdoc in uh, University of San Diego. Uh, then he moved to George Mason as an assistant professor and we started working in him, with him on the third major car hacking project that um, basically we were trying to show that uh, is the smartphone connectivity to IVI is safe, secure or not. So I'm going to walk you through basically to an anatomy of an attack that we did. But first I have to introduce what we attacked and what is this smartphone to IVI connectivity? What do I mean by that? So car manufacturers, to improve the user experience, equip the infotainment systems with extra features which usually are expensive. For example, when you want to buy a car, they ask you to pay like almost 6,000 extra to just have their own navigation system installed on your uh, IVI system. And then you have to, like every year or every couple of years, you have to take it there to upgrade it and update it, or maybe they ask for more money at the time. But if you, like me, you want to basically use your own smartphone and still use, be able to use your uh, Google map for navigation, so which is free and comes with the live data. So maybe using other apps to, or maybe you want to use other apps that you have on your phone to be connected to your loved ones when you're driving. So to answer this question, to answer to this need, manufacturers came up with this idea of integrating smartphone into infotainment systems and helps smartphones to be, to become more than just a distraction tool while you're driving. So you basically, just by a knob, turning a knob, or just with the voice command, you can just communicate with the applications and you're not distracted while you're driving. So the initial app platforms, such as Toyota, Etune, or BMW Connected Drive, largely it was, they were proprietary to a single manufacturers. Some of them have features like, for example, a dedica dedicated app to open the lock of the car or a steering wheel, but in a very famous ones that you are almost very familiar with them, it's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which are now pretty famous. But at the time that we were doing this, uh, basically this research, they were uh, in the fundamental steps and there were just rumors about to be deployed on the car. So basically they were not there when we started this um, research. What we did, we basically, before all of these platforms, there was another uh, protocol it was standardized by Car Connectivity Consortium. They were trying to basically generate a, a standard, global standard, a standardization for smartphone integration into the head units, and they were calling it MirrorLink. Basically, as the name implies, applications were running smoothly on the smartphone, and the, just the mirror, the display was mirrored on the IVI screen, and it was providing a seamless integration. So you can access and control applications as easy as just twisting a knob or with a voice command. And now you're just a phone update away from just a piece of heaven. So these are the kind of like some of the car manufacturers that have partnered with a car connectivity consortium on, 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 on supporting MirrorLink and with more on the way. So one of the reasons that I'm not going to mention the name of the car or the model or the brand uh, in addition to like practicing the public disclosure agreement, but also is because it is applicable to many of these car companies that I'm showing here. And it's not limited to basically one smartphone. There are several smartphones that are uh, supporting this protocol so far. Okay, so now we have a question in hand that can someone control your car by infecting your smartphone? So basically, infection on the smartphone is pretty like easy and it's pretty popular, but can somebody control a car, a car after they uh, hack your smartphone? So to answer that, we started to assess this uh, security of the mirror link uh, and see that how it's safe and secure to use a smartphone to IVA connectivity through mirror link. So what we did, we started our mission by buying an infotainment system from eBay that it's supposed to have the mirror link uh, protocol established on that. And then we jumped into reverse engineering that. So to give you a better picture on mirror link, here are its main components. Like it consists of two main hardware uh, devices like smartphone and the IVI, and also two pieces of software. Like, or one of them is running on the smartphone. 
the other one is running on the IBI system. And later we <coughs> realized that we learned that the application running on a smartphone is basically acting as a server, the other one is acting as a client. So then after understanding this architecture, the main architecture that how these two are connected and mirror link basically making this connection possible. So we started analyzing applications on each side of these devices to be able to understand the architecture and how it works and uh, diving deep into that. Here is lab, our lab setup to just capture the network <laughs> and to un just understand how these two devices are communicating to each other. So basically that's the USB sniffer that we built in our lab out of uh, BeagleBoard. And uh, so I was just sniffing the packets coming between talking this event after these two uh, guys were talking. So I was just capturing the packets and I was uh, doing the uh, deep analysis on that. And this is the architecture that we mapped out out of that communication um, sniffing. And we realized that it is using a set of non priority and very established technologies. So as the baseline, it uses USB T, USB 2, IP version 4, VNC. VNC is pretty <coughs> cool because they're using it for mirroring the uh, screen of the smartphone to the infotainment system. And also there is an RTP and the Bluetooth are designed for audio streaming and most importantly, it is using UPnP for network, com network configuration. So we have discussed the analysis for each of these layers and each of these uh, technologies in our paper, but instead of talking about all of them, um, I prefer to talk about my favorite one, my favorite layer, uh, which actually we found most vulnerabilities in there, uh, which is UPnP, or as they say, universal plug and play. But before that, let me, let me just show you a very lovely usage of standard protocols, for example, VNC, when people are trying to implement this standard. So the VNC protocol is supposed to be used for screen, uh, sending the, uh, actually mirroring this display, but the, the people that deployed this and implemented this, uh, instead of using a security type as a proper security type, they just chose none. So no matter how the standard is actually designed, that's a practice that, I don't know, it was a developer problem or um, the people that actually deployed this. So I'm just gonna raise awareness that these kind of like small things that are I'm showing here from now on is actually helping attackers to gain uh, what they want. So about UPnP, as you might know, it is called Universal Plug and Play, and it's a protocol that helps networked devices to discover each other in a network and usually with zero configuration, they can establish network services. Uh, from the network capture traffic that we had, we learned that MirrorLink, as I mentioned, is basically a smartphone is acting as a server. It's providing a list of the services <coughs> that can give to IBI. And IBI is acting as a client and listening to this network and to see who is the service provider and who we can actually get the services from. So after they find each other, they got paired, uh, radio requests some configuration files to set up this, the rest of the communication, and smartphone replies back by sending a list of applications that it supports, and also uh, the, basically the services I can provide, and radio sends a request to launch an application. It's pretty important because that's actually how we achieved the rest of our attack. So this is, this is a schematic of like the network traffic that we sniffed, and in that you can see that there is some packets going between these two uh, devices, and these are in the form of XML files. So if you figure out that the configuration files are in the form of XML. So, and there are some information on these XML files that we open up the packet. You can see that the information about the app, for example, the app ID, app name, application, like provider name, app icons name, these are the like a triggering point and if you are like a hacker, it's a kind of like a uh, light bulb for you that you see this stuff going on between devices. So what I did, I decided to basically impersonate smartphone application for the radio and I was trying, because we didn't have access to the inside of the infotainment system, so I was trying to impersonate this application on the smartphone and I wrote an application to be able to hijack the communication between these two devices, between the ap real application and the IBI system. So basically I was sitting on the smartphone with that, my own application, 
sending the malformed XML files and with the like I was actually be able to fuzz those configuration files. I played with the application name, application ID, even with the pictures or the like the icon names. And so what happened was at some point radio just stopped working. And I realized that okay. Uh, I saw smoke, so it means that there is someone sitting on the radio and parsing this information that I'm sending, and it just hang. I just cannot process it. So there should be an external parser on the other side that listening to me and just trying to parse it, but they cannot go after um, what I did. So it means that there is some problems there. There, there are some vulnerabilities, and immediately you might think about like buffer overflow or heap overflow or those sort of attacks. So the solution was we had to do the harder reverse engineering to extract the firmware from the radio to be able to see what is the software written there and what are the, actually the code for the parser over there. And it was a pretty hard task. It was, took us a long time to be able to decide the chips. I, we had to buy this chip reader from, I don't know, you came, we bought it from uh, Alibaba or, uh, yeah. And it took us like a couple of months to get to us. But we are able to actually uh, create such a setup. Uh, the flash reader, is, we built it out of the MSP430 controller. It was one of our, like, part of our project for the, um, what do you call it, Harvard, hard, 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 hardware uh, engineering class. But anyways, so <coughs> what we were able to, that, to do that, we ex extracted the firmware out of the radio in the first step, and the files were in binary format. So, it was just gibberish. We had to like run it into the IDA Pro and to try to be disassemble it. And there were two files that catches our, our eyes uh, on the like on the radio side that basically seems to be actually parsing or related to mirroring at some point. So those actually that I'm showing in the red, they are the main files that we paid more attention to them. Besides the files that are responsible for operating system of the uh, infotainment system. But ironically, among all of the protection mechanisms that you can think of, like the developers that should practice in terms of like secure programming practice, the developers of this piece of code only use a few of them. Like for example, Stack Cookie and ASLR was only been enabled in some of the few um, of these files. For example, a ASLR was not employed in the first one, which was actually the mirror link uh, file. And what it means when the ASLR is not enabled, it means that every time that this actually is running, so this data is gets loaded in the same place in the memory as always. So the location doesn't randomly change. So you have to just watch part of the memory to see what's going on there. So that's a pretty important feature if that's there. So it's better the developers use it, but they didn't. So it was a great help for us to do our reverse engineering. So as you can see here, ASLR is on some of them are available, but on the last one is not. So that was the final setup that we created in the lab. So each of these devices are very important in their, they have a special role in our uh, like reverse engineering, but the two ones that are very helpful and I really, to really uh, love them and I owe them. One of them is the red one, which is a UART. The other one that I actually annotated it as a B, uh, it is a, as I said here, it is JTAG, the JTAG debugger that help us to debug the messages from this uh, embedded system. So we use this setup to basically be able to fuzz the radio and see the reaction. And the UART, which uh, I used it here, I'm, I'm showing you how the UART helped me to figure out where is the vulnerability, but that's one of the vulnerabilities that I'm going to specifically talk about and show you how we actually found it, is that, so I messed up, I tried to fuzz the, for example, application name and I sent it using my app, the radio, and with the UART, basically, UART is helping the developers of this embedded system to be able to read the debug messages to see uh, uh, the progress and if there's an error there. And after I, the radio actually uh, hanged or stopped working, I got this message on the UART port, which says there is a crash in this address. So it gives me the address inside of the code. So I looked into IDA Pro, I disassembled these binaries that we found, we extracted from the firmware of the IVI, and I realized that there are some use of uh, memcopy and 
uh, basically pretty much as you can see here some of these um, common security practices that developers are supposed to do is using memcopy with actually the specified li length of the uh, length of the string that has to be uh, passed to this but apparently they didn't check the length of the uh, data that I was sending to the radio and the application ID was basically making this crash happen. So another learning point for the developers in here that don't use unsafe um, functions in your library. And then this is my JTAG uh, debugger. So I used that and also IDA Pro to do dynamic analysis. And what I did, the left side showing that basically when the application is running normally, and the right side is showing that when the application is uh, basically, I fed it with my malformed XML files and it's overriding the buffer and it's actually overriding the other buffers in other applications or other information on the memory. So, it means that there is a buffer or heap that is getting overflowed here. So in this case, it was a heap overflow. So after doing some heap feng shui, kind of like playing with this application ID, uh, application name or uh, fig, um, picture, uh, I was be able to basically find some pointers that a function pointer basically is being overwritten or data pointer were being overwritten that was causing this issue on the radio and stopped working. So. But what happened was, I found actually where is this crash happens. But the problem was, the problem for me as a hacker was basically, this setup was basically a MIPS assembly embedded system that was running, the operating system was Windows CE 6. And apparently, uh, after Windows, uh, basically the version 6, they started using a very, very strong and robust version of the heap. Actually, what it does is basically they separate the control data or the function pointers from the data data. So it's pretty hard for the hackers to just uh, find the function pointer in the data section of the memory. So it was almost impossible for me to find the function pointer to be able to override it and just simply show that, oh, okay, uh, I can override it with any function and the attack is done. But what I did, uh, basically I tried to do some tricks and I had to override correctly all of these data pointers to be able to jump to somewhere in the memory that the control uh, basically uh, data is there and basically the function pointers are there. So I remember almost eight or nine jumps I had to make to different locations in the memory to get to a function pointer. Yeah. So then what I did, because we were a student, we didn't want to break many radios. So I tried to just, as a showcase, to see if I can overwrite the function pointer that I found with a function, simple function as a print function. I overwrote it with a function that is just printing to the UART uh, debug port. And I just passed the string that you're hacked, smile. So it worked. It's basically it's showing that the function pointer that I found is pretty actually working and I could pass any function to that with any argument to that. So, so far what happened was I found a place in the memory that I can access from the, from the uh, smartphone. I can send a malicious packet. I can override some pointers and get to the point that I can override it with a function. So this function for this case was print function. But think about it. What other functions can be replaced here? So it turns out that uh, in the similar attack, in the similar report that came out by Charlie Murat and Chris Valasik, the hardware or the, uh, basically they were used in this model and in this car was also the same as what they use in the Uconnect. So basically we uh, just uh, saw that, okay, it's very similar and we did the same thing that how to basically attack to find the function pointer for accessing the MyCom components in the car which is one of these uh, com a pretty important components that we're able to talk to other critical components on the car. So what we did, we changed that function pointer to the function pointer that can talk to the CAN bus. And as an argument, we sent a packet, CAN packet, that could disable the break. So all the ingredients are there. 
and an attacker can send any arbitrary CAN packet to the canvas. So what I actually explained was just what we um, demoed to the car manufacturers, we showed them like it can be replaced with any um, argument like packet for the brakes, packet for the airbag, steering wheel, and those packets are pretty generic across multiple manufacturers. So as a final step, what we did, we communicated this to the manufacturer and demo to them. But we learned that this application that I was talking about, the mirror link, was a feature that was deployed on the radio heads, but was disabled on purpose. I don't know, maybe because they wanted to basically announce it as a future models. Uh, the reason that actually was uh, those, uh, it was just there as an over um, prototype. It was disabled by purpose, but they wanted to release it in future models. So what we did, we actually hacked something that's supposed to come out in the future. But to show you how hard was it to enable it, it was just uh, pretty as easy or as hard as just flipping a bit into the configuration file. And the mirror link was activated and enabled. So. In the abstract of my talk, I have it there. Sometimes car manufacturers, all of these cars that we have out there, we only can hack those features that are available there and we can see them and we can touch them and play with them. But sometimes some of these features are disabled or it's hidden from your eyes. So those features, you cannot hack them easily, but they are there. And some hackers are out there, try to actually exploit those and misuse those. So at the final step, we actually had some uh, responsible disclosure plan that they followed. We worked with the OEM and the, some regulators uh, called NISTA, it's uh, for National uh, Transportation Administration. And we did the private, uh, first private disclosure with them and we stayed not 11 months, we waited for 11 months for them to patch and basically disable this feature on all of their cars and work on the uh, upgrading those systems. And we didn't, we actually we decided to do no name, no shame, and no details released because it can affect, as I showed you, multiple car manufacturers. And also, these vulnerabilities should be patched, and we should give them more time to patch them. But what I mentioned here, what it, this all means, is that I want, we wanted to just uh, bring to the light that insecurities of IVM and app platform, uh, before they come widely deployed, it's very serious, and we have to think about that. And similar platforms with potential unknown vulnerabilities are there, for example, Apple CarPlay or Android, app, uh, Android Auto. So these are the smartphone connectivity to the infotainment system that nobody uh, thought about or nobody did research on them. So uh, basically you are, it's open. If anybody wants to take a lead on that, it would be great. So as a future research direction, I wanted to suggest that maybe there are, there are plenty of works should be done uh, for the future cars. For example, I have two, two Two examples for the future direction, like self-driving cars and V2V or vehicle-to-vehicle vehicle communication systems, which is coming very in the very near future. But something that's pretty important about the self-driving cars is that there is already some attacks shown by some academic researchers. For example, there was a recent one in uh, University of Michigan that they showed that they can put a just a hologram that is invisible to the human eyes on the stop sign. Ray, I mean, car that can, tra that actually they just, they use sensors and they, they use some image processing uh, algorithms. They just process that stop sign as a yield sign or maybe just a speed limit and they just rush to the traffic. So that they showed it actually for real is happening. And as I'm showing in this picture, that self-driving cars, they have so many sensors and all of these sensors can be tampered, can be played <coughs> with. So it's pretty um, dangerous if something happens. Because today I wanted to actually talk about like embedded systems or IoT devices, but the bigger IoT devices that is very important is, are the cars. Because if somebody hack your toaster or refrigerator, nothing devastating would happen, right? But the cars, we usually use them for carrying our loved ones like family. So it's very, very important and the consequences are, are non-returnable. So the major challenge, challenges, sorry, as a last point, uh, the car manufacturers, are dealing with is very important they have to keep in mind is that any proposed solution that we are giving so far, I mean, any solutions that uh, somebody's uh, basically giving for these car manufacturers, they have to consider these set of facts. So manufacturers are largely integrators. 
there is nothing that they own themselves, like not part of the code is from them. They integrate in course from different vendors, and when they wanted to just make a contract with different vendors, basically maybe two pennies decide which vendor they should go with, not the security uh, practice. And also there's an extreme uh, heterogeneity between the software and hardware. That was one of the attacks that they did, basically misusing this fact. And also, so basically what I'm trying to point is that the code, ins code inspection is not working in here, uh, really. The last point that I'm going to make is that any proposed solution should fit into the um, domain of the automotive system. And also, we have to be careful that how we are going to basically respond in the security situations to the safety critical components that being actually like having some issues. So for example, in this case, it's a joke, but if we want to implement some cryptographic algorithms in there, so it's kind of like pretty making it reality that if some, something crashes in the software, so we cannot get a real time response from those uh, critical systems. So by this, I mean ending my talk and I will open the floor for questions. Oh, sweet. Um, this was an excellent talk. Um, it also did a good job of summary, summarizing all of the different developments in car hacking. Because like some of the earlier stuff, I didn't have any insight into. Um, something so I profess ignorance here. Um, something that I've I've heard um, just in complaints about, let's say Tesla vehicles, uh, is the use of non-automotive grade uh, equipment, hardware, things like that, um, which leads me to surmise that there is a difference between automotive grade and non-automotive grade, um, which makes me also further conclude that automotive grade is probably going to be more resilient, probably um, exchanging performance for resiliency. Uh, did you see measurable performance issues that might have um, affected potential attacks, um, especially in, let's say, older cars? Like attacks that might have been feasible in current computing hardware that would not be feasible in cars simply because they're built to automotive grade and therefore are probably using older, more resilient hardware? So if I want to rephrase your question, you mean that if <clears throat> the new cars are more prone because the, as compared to the older ones, because of the, basically they were trying to achieve some performance uh, achievements as opposed to the older ones, or it's reverse? I mean, that's, that's, that's one way of interpreting it, yeah. Okay, so pretty yes, because one of the things that is still there is basically using, for example, as I mentioned, this CAN network, right? It was there at the beginning, at the design of the cars, is that that's how they work, right? They just, the CAN network is supposed to be working it like that and it's broad, broadcast nature. But they couldn't fix it yet. They couldn't add cryptography. There were some attempts to basically encrypt those packets and nobody or authenticate those packets and then they are sending to ECUs. But there were no successful uh, uh, basically result out of that because there were performance issues in that case that they couldn't actually uh, basically, there are some critical applications. For example, as I mentioned, for example, for brick. So you cannot wait for the algorithm, cryptography algorithm to authenticate and just decrypt the message. Okay, thanks, Saha, for sharing this scary research with us. <laughs> um, I'm so glad I don't drive a new vehicle. Oh, my, my new S car is 2005, uh, so it's off the grid. Um, just out of interest, how much did it cost to fund this research? Uh, and I'm thinking about it from, if you can do this, what can a state actor do? So basically, since, as I mentioned, uh, we were students, we were not, for example, some other researchers that there were DARPA funded. So we couldn't afford so many radio heads to break them. So we had to just buy some radios from the eBay and some like devices like UR. They're pretty kind of like cheap. You cannot buy them like from Amazon or any of these, as I mentioned, Ali, uh, Alibaba or I don't know, from these websites. But I cannot give you a whole estimation. It was 2016, uh, but it didn't cost us so much because it was done like more of a, we found some flaws in the software. We didn't need to t dig into the hardware per, per se to buy some hardware stuff. Hi there, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, just a quick question. So from the recon to exploiting the vulnerability and you know taking action, whatever that may be, disabling airbags, whatever, um, what would be the, the exact timetable that an attacker would be looking at 
to, to do that? So it's actually, it, you can, it, is, it depends on the project or depends on what you are attacking. Because as I mentioned, so for example, for, I was trying to, ex I, we found a vulnerability in the software, as I showed you, like it's a buffer overflow or heap overflow. But to weaponize it, it took us like maybe a couple months because I had to find that function pointer. And uh, it took us so long that we had to learn. I learned it from hardware, hard way that the heap on the, um, Windows C6 is designed in the way that the control data is separate from data. Function pointers are separate. So there is no way that you can easily override function pointer. So basically, there are different, each phase of the project took us different amount of time as opposed to like different researchers. So for example, for Charlie and Chris, they, it may take them less because they were just attacking one component and telematics doing that was happened before. But uh, it pretty much depends on like what is your target, what device and what uh, car manufacturer you're targeting. But uh, yeah, I guess we have to practice all of these security things that I mentioned and taking them seriously. Thank you so much. Let's give her a round.